Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about tech leadership, internet safety, and staying motivated as an ed tech leader. We're really glad you're here. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. We are so glad that you're joining us, and I have an amazing guest today. I'm honored to bring on my uh, my good friend and fellow CEO and entrepreneur, amazing individual, Randy Fagan from Safe to Net. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here, Will. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we have, I have lots of good stuff because Safe to Net has so many good things going on. Uh, you were based in England, coming to the United States. Can you kind of share a little bit about the story? Yeah, happy to. So the, the Safe Tenet was originally founded in the UK um, based upon the premise that there's a whole world out there of benefits for you know children and, and families to enjoy the internet and learn from and experience. But at the same time, there are a lot of challenges and things that are scary, right? So so the focus and, and the mission for Safe Tenet is to really focus on safeguarding and providing well-being capabilities and tools to to children to help them become uh, more responsible digital citizens. When they get their cell phones or their tablets, there's no rules, there's no understanding for how they work and what they get access to. And so it's really focused on teaching children in the moment um, what's okay to send, what's not okay to send, and making sure that we don't um, at all invade their privacy. And so that's been a really critical element for us. Well, and, and I want to get into the product and all the details of the product too, but before we jump in too deep, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what brings, what was, um, interesting and kind of lured you into safe to net and to become part of their team? Sure. Of course. Yeah. So, so I started out on wall street um, I'm a native New Yorker originally, and now I'm from California, and we'll get into that in a moment, but started out on Wall Street as a sell side analyst analyzing companies, and then moved to the California um, Bay Area and decided that tech would probably be a better place for me, and so I went internal to tech companies. And most of what I have focused on in the past is really focused around internet infrastructure, so building the internet. Um, so companies like Stratacom, Cisco, Juniper Networks, were really where I, I spent most of my time and um, got in really small. So I was really fortunate that I got into these companies really small and was part of growing them to multi-billion dollar companies. And so whether that's through, you know, exits, you know, and acquisitions or IPOs, I've been involved in all of that. And, and I, I feel really fortunate to have such a, a great background in the tech industry. I took a little stint doing something that was slightly different outside of networking um, as a transition over the last four years. And then about a year ago, I joined safe to net. So I joined May of last year. And for me, it really has been about coming in early, making sure that we can create the right strategy to launch in the U S so sale, like literally setting up the office, um, you know, sales, marketing partnerships, um, getting the app ready for the U S market and the U S launch. And so I've been there for about a year now, and it's just been incredible in terms of the people, the technology, and what we're really able to do within the market. Right. Well, I know that they're glad to have you. And, you know, from our, yeah. our conversations and ongoing conversations, it's been fun to see the journey so far as you guys are, you know, launching in the U.S. and rolling things out and doing great PR and all of the masterful things that you do as a CEO and have a great team backing you up. The the product itself to me is fascinating in that, you know, when I sat with you and you, you reviewed it with me, can you, can you kind of describe for our audience the, the product, the overlay and the AI? I think the AI application is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So we're basically a safeguarding and well-being app <clears throat> that is focused on young people and provides them the opportunity to get educated about what it takes to be a safe and responsible digital citizen when they're online. So it's, it's an app. And what happens is the child and the parent get paired up. And when the parent downloads the app, they are able to connect their device to a child's device. 
and they get to see their um, safety indicator score and notifications, and they get to see number of messages sent, they get to see which messages were potentially risky, but they never actually see the content of the child's messages, which is very significant and a huge differentiator. Um, we're really the only ones that do that. When the child downloads the app, the most important thing, and again, this is really for the child, is they get a keyboard overlay. And so no different than you can download other types of keyboards, you would, they, they get to download the SafetyNet keyboard. And as they're typing into that keyboard, um, it gives them advice and guidance. So it might potentially filter something out that's really bad. So if it's focused on something like bullying or cyberbullying or aggression, um, it might completely filter it out. But there's also areas where it's going to just give guidance and help that child get through the process. And as that child is typing, it will also pop up elements for advice and guidance. So if the AI thinks that there's some cyberbullying going on, then it's going to pull up a cyberbullying advice and guidance module so that the child can read through that. Similarly, if they think that there might be some dark thoughts or some fear or anxiety or stress, We've got another element of the app, which is the well-being element. And the great thing about that is as the AI determines and contextualizes that that might be happening, it pops up a well-being tool. And so children can listen to audio guided tours, their breathing exercises where they follow, you know, the breathing bar, breathing up and down and it's rhythmic, or there's some that are just audio based and really to help the child in the moment. And that's so critical because kids do things so quickly when they're on things like social media, but the important thing is to get them to stop and pause and to think about what they're gonna send before they actually send it. Because as we know, everything's public and permanent once they do send it. So that's the major gist of, of the app without getting into um, too much of the granular details, but it's really you know intended to be a tool for the child. And the fact that um, parents can feel comforted with the fact that children have this tool without invading their privacy. Right. Well, and to me, that is a big differentiator that you guys have, is that it's so respectful of both people in the relationship. The parent is getting information, but not private information. They're just getting, here, here are the patterns that we're seeing with your child, so that they're the privacy between the parent and child is still respected. And so I think that that's going to help with your adoption of teenage users because, you know, mom and dad aren't seeing what I'm typing. They're just getting a notification. Hey, she sounds mad or, you know, there, there's a, a pattern there. I, I think that it's deeply respectful of the kid. And so for me that when we met, when I was at No Bully and at the, it was the family online safety conference, mm -hmm. that was, that was one of the big pieces that caught my eye because it was so respectful of the users. Sometimes we impose technology on users and don't really think about those impacts of how are they going to feel about it, the user experience, where you guys are very, very cautious and very uh, respectful of the users. I think that yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, and I think one of the important things here, Will, is that, and, and this is certainly some advice maybe for the audience as well, is that we incorporated children's opinions in the development stage of the product. And so as we were developing the product, we had what we called youth advisory boards. And so we had children that we worked with, um, we went to schools, we went to middle schools, we brought people into the office um, to get their insights and not only to um, learn from them as, as, as it relates to what is it that they would be comfortable using? What is it that they would be comfortable with their parents knowing or not knowing? Number one for them was privacy. We don't want our parents seeing every single thing we said, but we do want them to know that we're being safe and responsible. So that part's okay. Um, and so having, having the ultimate user involved in the development process to understand what they want and don't want, I think was really important. Well, and if there's a lesson for other ed tech companies, I think that that's a big one in that, you know, again, we're not supposed to impose technology on kids. We're not supposed to just because I said so. You're supposed to take a look at user experience and, and how are they actually going to engage because engagement in your software, or your technology is the ultimate goal, right? There, there are too many programs 
that are beautifully designed by engineers that don't understand kids, don't understand education, that just sit and don't get used. And I, I think that, again, the differentiation, the thoughtful approach that Safe to Net takes in developing the process and including students and including teenagers, uh, absolutely to be commended for that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, having the conversation and the dialogue between the parent and the child is really important um, to ensure that the child understands why the parents are interested in them using it. But equally important is we want the kids to use it, right? We want them to view it as a well-being tool. We want them to view it as, you know, maybe they make it like some kids say, oh, I want to make sure that I get a perfect score on it so that my parents use the safety indi indicator score that's perfect. And they've almost gamified it to some extent. We've got a really new keyboard that just came out that allows them to um, change some of the capabilities and customize the keyboard. So making it a tool that the kids really want to use is really important as, as, you're, as you're pointing out in your perspective. Right. One of the other pieces, as you're looking at the uh, England-based market and you're looking at the U.S.-based market, what modifications have you guys had to take into consideration with that? Yeah, it's a great question. So when I joined the company, <clears throat> Um, we were working on releasing the next version of the UK version and the German version. And as we know, as we're using keyboards in different countries, it needs, the AI needs to be trained and understand the different languages. And there are enough differences between British English in the UK and the US. And so we had to do a lot of work around bringing in the cyber psychology, the cyber psychologists and research and um, understanding more of the U.S. market as it relates to being able to provide a valuable tool for the U.S. market because the, the innuendos are different, the slang is different, um, some actual words in the vocabulary have very different meanings, and I'll spare you some of those, but um, some of them can mean you're upset versus some of them you can, it can mean that you're drunk or um, and, and for those that are uh, worldly, might know some of those examples, but um, some of the words and innuendos and slangs that are used are very localized to certain regions and certainly certain countries. So a lot of what we had focused on is ensuring that the AI is learning more of what the American culture and U.S. culture is like relative to some of the other cultures that are out there. Right. Okay, so let's jump to England for just a minute. I know that the Safety Net Foundation has something really exciting going on. Uh, you wanna mm -hmm. talk about that? Yeah, so uh, last week we partnered, and obviously it, was, it didn't just happen last week, we've been talking to them for quite a long time. And, and Richard Percy, who's the, the CEO of the parent company, um, is phenomenal and has been working with the UK government for quite some time. And so last week it finally came to fruition where they are promoting the Safe to Net app um, free to users in the UK to 1 million citizens. Wow. So, you know, we do know, look, we, we do know that in order for Safe to Net sur to survive, we, we need to, to charge to pay employees to do things. But for a time like right now, especially with COVID-19 going on, more and more kids are at home all day long. And that's really, really hard, not just for, for the kids, but for the parents, because the parents are working from home and they don't know half the time what their kids are doing upstairs. And so we don't want price to be an inhibitor for um, families to be able to use our app. So partnering with the UK government and being able to have the Safe to Net Foundation offer those 1 million free licenses to UK citizens has, has been very well received and we hope we'll just continue to safeguard families and children. Right. So are you seeing uh, user behaviors change pre-COVID, post-COVID? Are you guys tracking any trends? What are you seeing there? Big time. Um, so, so one of the big ones is uh, sexting. And so we've seen a significant shift sort of pre-COVID where most of that was happening on the weekends and in the evenings. Now we see it all day long, every day. Um, it doesn't matter what time of day or what day of the week it is. So that's one example where um, honestly sexting has gone up threefold since before oh, COVID. Wow. So yeah, like scary numbers. And you know, 
when you when you look at it, it makes sense, and you go, okay, yeah, there'll probably be more because you know people are in relationships or kids, you know, young people are in relationships and they can't be together, so they're trying to figure out kind of how to be together while they're you know sheltered in place and social distancing. So um, it's it's really critical that young people understand that whatever you send out is going to remain there. And so trying to protect them from their themselves by not either allowing them to send it or making them think twice about sending something is really important. Right. So as a CEO, as a, as an ed tech leader coming into the U S market, what are the challenges that you've seen come as you're, you know, moving the product into the U S market? What are those challenges you've seen? Maybe some approaches you've taken and some success stories. Sure. So, so the challenges of coming into the, the U.S. market are, you know, the fact that there's localization that is really important. I think I think we successfully have um, solved that problem. Uh, we yeah. launched on April 30th uh, in the U.S. and so what 60 days ago, actually 60 go, 60 days ago to the day. So time is perfect for this. Um, and then we've also come out with a new release last week with a with an updated AI and some customization features. So I think you know the biggest challenges were kind of just the localization and helping to really understand the U.S. market and get the research to ensure that when we launched in the U.S. that we did it right. Because as we know, with an app, if you use the app, you've got a very quick period of time for people to either like it or dislike it. And so we didn't want to launch prematurely um, with either, you know, software bugs or significant issues. And look, it's never going to be 100% perfect when you first roll something out. But I think we've done a really good job. Um, you know, I think in terms of, you know, the, the marketing piece of it and getting our brand out there um, and differentiating ourselves, I think that is probably the hardest part. It's really for us to our, easy for us to articulate, but there are a lot of what I'll call parental control companies that are out there. And what parental control companies are typically doing is they are enforcing a level of control. The parent is in control, not the child. The child's not getting educated. The child's not getting advised. It's the parent saying, no, you can't do this. And we don't do that at all. Right. So for us, it's about privacy. It's about giving the child a tool that can educate them. And it's providing a pattern of reports back to the parent, but not tattling on them, not spying on them. So I think the hardest thing for us is there's already some parental controls, control companies that are incumbent within the U.S. market and us trying to create uh, and an understanding of what our differentiation is, of course, is going to be a journey. But I think we right. we know it, we get it, people understand it once they hear it. But getting it out to the broader market is obviously a challenge. And I know ultimately we'll be successful doing that with the support of folks like yourself. Um, well, but it will be a journey. Yeah, absolutely. So as a leader, again, well, first, let me let me just step back. There's a critical lesson in that, in what Randy just said for our audience members, because she talked about not releasing too early, making sure that it's correct, only getting one real chance to launch your technology product within a fairly small window. Uh, I can't reinforce that enough. I've seen so many companies that have a good idea that they wanna launch right away. But until you go through that thoughtful process, as we see modeled by SafetyNet, you're going there will be bugs there will be issues and for companies to really take that thoughtful approach of not looking immediately toward revenue but looking immediately toward value and looking immediately toward quality is so important because again that first chance to uh, one chance to make a first impression is incredibly important so i appreciate you bringing that up simply because I think that applies to so many of our clients and so many companies that come to us when we ask them to kind of slow down a little bit. As exciting as the whole process is of launching a product, you know, let's check all the boxes, let's double check. Has, you know, Aunt Mildred checked the, the software as well just to make sure that all the bugs are out because you want that user experience to be so good, especially in that initial open. 
Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a really critical point, Will, because one of the things that, you know, that I really tried to instill in the team is there were certain things that were going to be an absolute go, no go decision, right? So if there was an issue with the subscriptions or if there was an issue with, um, you know, specific accuracy around certain things, um, it's like, no, we are, we're not going live. We will push the data out if we have to. And then there are other things where we say, you know, we can fix that in the next release. It's not that big of a deal. It's not critical to the child's safety and it's not critical to either the child or the parent's user experience. Right. And so I think if you think about user experience kind of to the point that you're highlighting, I think user experience is that absolute number one piece and then two factual accuracy. Um, all of the other things you can kind of fix along the way. Yeah, I, I recently had a client that, and I'm not going to name the client because they're working on this particular bug, but they were really frustrated by the fact that they weren't converting from their 30 day free trial to their paid subscription model. And they had me take a look at the product and, you know, it's so important for your team to go back and check and check and check because when they got to the paywall, the paywall had a bug in it. So they weren't getting conversions mm -hmm. to paid subscriptions because there was a simple bug in the paywall and they had gone for three or four months without converting free trials into paid subscriptions. And it was just, you know, it was heartbreaking for me to be able to come back and say, you know, you, you need to try your own software. You need to look in the app store because just all of that user experience stuff is so critical and making it, you know, the happy journey of your client or however you want to call it so critical and so i know that you have a keen eye for detail and that you worked with that on your team and i think that that's contributed to your successful launch yeah the qa process yeah. is so important and it's anywhere from testing out every link making sure that you know it works on every device whether it's a phone or a tablet or it's ios or it's you know android and you know, having multiple users um, use it, and you know, calling on friends and saying, "Hey, do me a favor. Can you just go through this process for us really quick? Because we're so embedded in it on a day-to-day -day basis, it would be really great for a new pair of eyes to be able to do that." Um, and so, you're absolutely right. That QA is so instrumental to whether or not uh, individuals will have a, a, a positive experience out of the gate. Right. Well, and you know, when you're in and you're building something. It's tedious work, right? You know, the QA work, I appreciate the people that are so meticulous and can go through and do that well. If you don't have someone like that on your team to our audience, find them, right? You want that obsessive, compulsive, check every link, meticulous uh, person on your team because they're really good at that type of work. Um, so switching gears for a second, what keeps you staring at the ceiling at night? What are, what are the things that you worry about? Uh, <laughs> related to, you know, your work, um, you know, that there are things that are those constant nags. And so what, what is, what keeps you staring at the ceiling at night? Yeah. So there's one basic premise, which is how do we safeguard and protect more children around the world? And then everything sort of flows from there. And so then during the night, you know, my mind starts going and saying, oh, well, we can work with you know, this organization or this foundation or this, you know, mobile operator. And so for me, the thing that keeps me up at night is that there's there's not enough uh, young people that are protected yet. And there's still, you know, numbers that are very alarming regarding dark thoughts and suicides and cyberbullying. And, you know, we see it all over the press every day now, right? It's in the last 12 months, it has really blossomed to some of the, you know, front pages of these, you know, parental magazines and, and youth magazines on the challenges that children are facing with, with social media <clears throat> or, you know, celebrities and stars. And we're not trying to protect celebrities and stars purely because that's not within our age bracket typically. But, um, but it's happening. I mean, a, you know, hate speech. Look at what we're going through right now in the U.S., the hate speech that is being faced online is awful. It's hitting unprecedented levels or we're going back to times in history where, um, <clears throat> you know, awful things were happening. And so 
things like hate speech and cyberbullying are things that keep me up at night. And how do we just protect more children from that? Right. Well, and, and that makes me think of in an article that I just recently wrote called What Now? An Open Letter to School Leaders. It talks about kids are coming back different. They now will have a life event that is significant and can be traumatic. I can't imagine what many kids are having to go through and you know the tendency toward dark thoughts or dealing with an abusive relationship, something like that within their shelter in place. Schools and parents need to be aware and open-minded enough to be able to look at products like Safe to Net to help engage in that conversation because it's, it's an, you know, we keep hearing unprecedented time. It's going to be a difficult time as kids return back to school to return to whatever sense of normalcy there is, whatever sense of communication and safety there is. So I love the timing of, of Safe to Net and you guys being on with us. As the school year approaches, I think it's important for schools to be aware that there are multiple tools out there that can help with at least the identification of, hey, there, there's a kid that might need us. And Safe to Net, you know, does that so well. Um, the social emotional needs of, of students is, is at my heart. I worked for No Bully, did lots of work with them. And so that's one of the, the pieces that I think schools need to make sure and have in place as they reopen in whatever status that is, if it's a hybrid model or fully back or fully online, they need to be aware that their kids are bringing emotion back with them of this new life experience of shelter in place. So I, I, I just, I wanna make sure that schools are aware that you know the products are here and that there are smart teams that are addressing this daily. And so if we do nothing else and then give a school a link, a company or whatever that they can reach out to to help a kid, you know, it's the same thing that you were staring at the ceiling about, right? It's just, let's help more kids. That was my mantra as a, as a teacher. It's my mantra as a, as a company owner. And so, no, I, I absolutely appreciate that. Um, so as a leader, the, I mean, the workload is huge. I, I, I always think of, uh, what is it? Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill and then it rolls back down and you got to push it back up. And that's kind of the life as the entrepreneur and the leader and all of that. So how do you keep yourself most motivated on a personal level? What, what are your habits or anything that you do to stay motivated as a leader? Yeah, so I guess there's a couple of things. There, there's those that are specific to safe to net. I've got two kids. <clears throat> I've got a boy and a girl growing up in this digital age. Um, you know, losing opportunities to socialize and be outside, but trying to really take advantage of the family time, right? Whether it's board games or movie night or cooking or baking. So, you know, trying to just stay present and in the moment, I think is really important. <clears throat> and, you know, allowing ourselves to sort of have a level of forgiveness for all of the things that are, are going around us, right? And so let's try to right. focus on the positive and the silver linings in all of this. And so um, I, I really try to do that. Um, I, I practice yoga. So that's cool. that helps me a lot and keeps me motivated. But I think the primary motivation for me really goes back to the fact that as a parent, I've always focused on teaching my child table manners saying please and thank you. Don't get into a car with strangers, right? Don't take candy from a stranger. So to me, the thing that's so motivating is with, with Safe to Net and as a leader here, and especially in this industry, is it's, so how, how do we take all of that and apply that to the current day? So I, I think about um, very frequently, the social media elements of things like that. So we need to be teaching children from day one, like we do table manners or stranger danger, whatever it might be, how to be good, safe, responsible digital citizens. And that number one thing, just because I have two kids and hopefully someday I'll have grandkids, keeps me very motivated. And then I need to just make sure that I'm 
being the best parent that I can be, being the best spouse that I can be, the best daughter that I can be. And it all really just aligns very nicely. Right. So if you had one piece of advice for an ed tech founder, right? We we get approached by startups all the time, always looking for, you know, that piece of wisdom from someone that is has already traveled the path once or twice or three times. Um, but what would that piece of advice be? So I think the main piece of advice is to ensure that you are getting advice and that you have people that are on the user end a part of your team and a part of your development and a part of um, rolling the product out. And so we talked a little bit about um, kids helped us develop the tool because it's for kids. And I think that that's really important. Um, I also think making sure that the folks in the industry, whether they're organizations or nonprofits or you know for profits, that those that are passionate about the industry are really important to partner with because it's not just about what the company to do. Anything that we're doing in ed tech takes a village. And I think I think having a hat on and just saying, hey, we're going to go this alone is a really long and, and tough journey. But I think if you if you build really an organization and an ecosystem of organizations and individuals that are um, equally as passionate and are equally as thoughtful about the approach that we can make significant impact. Yeah, I I see those people that bring a sense of humility to the work uh, as often catapulting beyond those that bring the arrogance, which I love because it's those that have the open ears, those that have the willingness to learn, to listen, to reach out and say, you know what, we're having a challenge with this. Can you help me out? Or do you know anyone at this company? Or do you know anyone here? Uh, And it's it's really that network at at, at Tech, one of our mottos is, you know, rising tides lift all boats. Mm -hmm. And we really try and live by that as a company where, you know, if you call me or say, hey, do you know someone at this company or in this agency or whatever, you're absolutely gonna get that. And so I think that's fantastic advice for, for ed tech leaders, especially in startups. You don't have to know it all, but there are lots of people that know pieces that when you combine that network, you've got a great resource and a good safety net. Um, so uh, with every, uh, interview we always end with because we want to give a shout out to other people in the industry so is there a favorite techie product that you couldn't live without or a favorite techie product that you enjoy and love oh wow there there's a a few of them um and they're not necessarily startups um but just in general so so we got an echo show and the echo show if you're not if you or the audience are not familiar with it is it's, it's a device, but it's a it's video, right? So it's basically a video version of Alexa. And the thing that I love about it is I got one for my dad for Father's Day. And so instead of my father, who's 85, is trying to figure out, you know, the laptop or the phone or whatever, all you do is say, you know, call Randy Feigen's Alexa show and boom, we're on video. And so it's, um, you know, a function of being able to stay connected. It's the ability to, you know, have that personal connection. So it's not just a phone call and it's just really easy to use. So I think that that's a great one. Um, Smaller companies, there's an app that there's actually a couple apps that I really like. So um, one is called Let's View. I found that by happenstance. Um, because it mirrors what's on your phone to your laptop or vice versa. Oh, so for okay. somebody like me, so this could be a really interesting um, opportunity for some of the audience members. So if you have an app that you show on your phone, but you're doing, but you need to do a demo and you're doing it on your laptop, yeah. you can mirror the phone onto the laptop. It's called Let's View. And uh, I have found that to be really useful because I could do whatever it is on my phone and then the person on the other end can see everything that I'm doing um, through the, the video conference. All right. Very good. Randy, I can't thank you enough. This has been so fun. So safe to net 
it's at the Google Play Store, the, um, the Galaxy Store, and the Apple Store, right? Correct. Right. We wish you guys nothing but success. I can't thank you enough for the, the interview today, for taking the time. We know as you're starting up, this is an incredibly busy time, and we appreciate you spending it with us. Um, of course. Well, well, thank you so much for having me. Right. Um, so we also need to send a thank you to our sponsors, uh, workvivo.com, Schoolstream, and STEM Minds. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show today. We look forward to your comments. And again, safe to net, uh, safe to net .com. We appreciate it. Randy, have a great day. Thanks so much.